there is a common thread running through all of life. The thread is an incredibly long molecule that carries all of evolutionary history along its length. It is inside every cell of every living thing, from the smallest creature to the very largest. The secret of life is a molecule called DNA. If we could magnify DNA 10 million times, this is what it would look like. The latest computer animations enable us to see how it is intricately wrapped up inside each of our cells like a thousand mile long strand of spaghetti. The idea that a single molecule could contain all the instructions to build every living thing shocked the world when it was first realized 50 years ago. It's still an astonishing concept today. How is it possible? Hidden within these coils is a code that once broken would reveal the secret of life. There were not many clues. When scientists looked down a microscope, all they could see were the chromosomes, the big bundles of DNA that become visible as the cell divides. They could see the complexity of the developing organism, but what was controlling it? How were life's instructions written in the DNA? was the greatest question in biology. Every cell in this juggler's body is programmed by her DNA code. We can begin to understand DNA's role in shaping even the most complex biological systems by looking at our own attempts to reproduce reality. A programmer can accurately simulate the action of the juggler using computer software. Our artificial juggler never drops a ball unless the software engineer programs her to do so. Such simulations are built up from thousands of lines of computer code precise instructions that determine how the 3D model should behave. The computer acts on the instructions by turning on and off millions of microscopic switches that direct the flow of signals around its circuits. There is a similar kind of software working inside everything that is alive. It is based on the DNA molecule. Instead of binary ones and zeros used by computers, biological software works on four letters, A, C, G, and T. These are the four chemical building blocks of the DNA molecule. They are made of nucleic acid, which gives DNA its tongue-twisting full name deoxyribonucleic acid. The big riddle facing scientists 50 years ago was how these building blocks fitted together. If they could discover the chemical structure of this gooey, mysterious substance, it might provide clues which would explain how DNA controlled life. The scientists working on the problem were on the verge of making one of the greatest discoveries of the 20th century. Their names, Francis Crick and Jim Watson. This unlikely duo, working in Cambridge, England, became obsessed with the problem. Crick was a fast-talking British physicist who loved chasing new ideas. 
Watson was a precocious American biologist with laser-sharp focus. When Watson caught a sneak preview of an unpublished picture of DNA from X-ray studies done by Rosalind Franklin in London, he realized immediately the molecule must have a spiral shape. Back in Cambridge, Watson was desperate to explore DNA's 3D structure by building models. One Saturday morning in the spring of 1953, he rushed into the Cavendish laboratory, eager to start work. The Cavendish shop was to build us some tin models, and that took too long. And, uh, you know, finally in desperation, I made some other cardboard. I began moving them around, and I wanted an arrangement, you know, where I had a big and a small molecule, and uh, so how did you do it? Somehow, you had to, to form link bonds. So uh, here's uh, A, and here's T, and uh, I wanted this hydrogen to point directly at this nitrogen. So I had something like this. Ooh. So then I went to the, the pair, and I wanted this nitrogen to point to this one. And I went like this. Boom. They look the same. And you can put one right on top of the other. We knew we could just, you know, even if we go up to the ceiling, we were building a, a tiny fraction of a molecule. Hundred of million of these base pairs in one molecule all fitting into this wonderful symmetry, which we saw, you know, the morning of February 28th, uh, 1953. It isn't that it looks so beautiful, it's the idea, I think, of the structure and what it does, which is because of its beauty, its simplicity, that's really, really what uh, makes people say it's beautiful, which I think is the right word. And it was very unexpected that it should be as simple and as striking as that. Hidden within the spiral molecule was a simple pattern that enabled Watson and Crick to understand the chemical basis of life. Untwist the spiral, and DNA can be seen as two parallel strands. That's why it's sometimes called the double helix. Unzip the strands, and you have two linear sequences of the letters A, C, G, and T. The precise order of the letters along the molecule carries the coded instructions. These are the equivalent of binary ones and zeros in a computer. One strand is like a mirror image of the other. An A always pairs with a T, and a C with a G. So if you know the sequence of one strand, you can work out the sequence of the other. It dawned on Watson and Crick that this mirror copy of the code was the key to understanding how the genetic information could be passed on. So the essence of life could be explained with chemistry. There were no mysterious life forces. Everything has molecules. There's nothing but molecules organized in some way with instructions passed on from one generation to another. I think this is, you know, what uh, uh, Francis Crick and I felt, you know, when we saw the DNA structure. The structure immediately suggests how genetic information is copied and passed on. When a cell divides, the two strands of DNA separate, and a new matching copy is built using the original strand as a template. The result is two new molecules of DNA, each a duplicate of the original. Simple in theory, but the reality turns out to be amazingly intricate. 
Using computer animation based on the latest research, we are now able to see how DNA is actually copied in living cells. You are looking at an assembly line of amazing miniature biochemical machines that are pulling apart the DNA double helix and cranking out a copy of each strand. The DNA to be copied enters the production line from bottom left. The whirling blue molecular machine is called helicase. It spins the DNA as fast as a jet engine as it unwinds the double helix into two strands. One strand is copied continuously and can be seen spooling off to the right. Things are not so simple for the other strand because it must be copied backwards. It is drawn out repeatedly in loops and copied one section at a time. The end result is two new DNA molecules. It's similar to copying information on a computer. Hundreds of megabytes of data can be backed up in minutes by burning a copy onto a CD. The copying process is accurate, typically less than one mistake in a billion. The DNA copying process in our bodies is even more accurate, a thousand times better than most computers. Remarkable biochemical systems have evolved to double-check the new DNA strand and fix any mistakes. This phenomenal accuracy is very important. As we will see, just a single letter mistake in the DNA code can have terrible consequences. So far, we have only focused on the first part of the secret of life. How, when the chromosomes divide, information is passed from one generation to the next. But the other big question is how that information is turned into flesh and blood. This is where the concept of a gene enters the story. A gene is simply a length of DNA code letters that carries the instructions to make a protein. Proteins are basic components of our bodies. They are the main ingredient of obvious structures, such as our eyes, our skin, our hair, and our muscles. Proteins also play a hidden but highly important role. As enzymes, they act as molecular machines that carry out numerous chemical operations in the cell. That helicase copying DNA at the speed of a jet engine, it's an enzyme. There are thousands of different enzymes that scurry around our cells, performing all kinds of tasks. Enzymes are the miniature engines of life. They are made of protein. So the second part of the secret of life is that the DNA code is no more and no less than a set of instructions to build proteins. Consider the blood system that keeps our body supplied with oxygen. The heart pumps blood through the lungs where it picks up oxygen. The oxygen is carried in the red blood cells by a highly specialized protein called hemoglobin. In this red blood cell, there are 280 million hemoglobin molecules, each ready to do its job as an oxygen transporter. So how does the DNA make a protein such as hemoglobin? Proteins are made of building blocks called amino acids. There are 20 different kinds. Linked together in chains, they form proteins. 
It's the precise order of amino acids that determines what kind of protein is made and what it does. So the next big challenge was to work out how the four letters of DNA could code for each of the 20 amino acids that make protein. Back in the 50s, it seemed a tough nut to crack. The first question was, how many DNA letters coded for each amino acid? If it was one DNA letter for one amino acid, then you could only code for a maximum of four amino acids. Two letters in every possible combination could code for up to 16 amino acids. Still not enough. But three DNA letters provide more than enough combinations to code for all 20 amino acids. So three was the answer. It was a triplet code. However, scientists still didn't know how these triplets of DNA letters could produce a string of amino acids. I thought the problem would last me my lifetime. I had no idea it would be solved within 20 years. <laughs> what you are about to see is DNA's most extraordinary secret the innermost workings of how a simple code is turned into flesh and blood. This is what Francis Crick called the central dogma of modern biology, how DNA makes protein. It starts with a bundle of factors assembling at the start of a gene. It's these that trigger the first phase of the process, reading off the information that will be needed to make the protein. The gene is the length of DNA stretching away to the left. Everything's ready to roll. Three, two, one. The blue molecule racing along the DNA is reading the gene. It's unzipping the double helix and copying one of the two strands. The yellow chain snaking out of the top is a copy of the genetic message, and it's made of a close chemical cousin of DNA called RNA. The building blocks to make the RNA enter through an intake hole. They are matched to the DNA, letter by letter, to make an exact copy of the A's, C's, G's, and T's of the gene. The only difference is that in the RNA copy, the letter T is replaced with a closely related nucleic acid known as U. You are watching this process, called transcription, in real time. It's happening right now in almost every cell in your body. It's a bit like taking the information off a hard disk on a computer and put it into memory, put, you know, making it a real program that's running. So that process of DNA to RNA is like making, it's like running a program, you know, double clicking on, a, on an icon. When the RNA copy is complete, it snakes away from the nucleus and into the outer part of the cell. Then in a dazzling display of choreography, all the components of another molecular machine lock together around the RNA to form a miniature factory called a ribosome. It translates the genetic information in the RNA into a string of amino acids that will become a protein. Special transfer molecules, the green triangles, bring each amino acid to the ribosome. The amino acids are the small red tips attached to the transfer molecules. There are different transfer molecules for each of the 20 amino acids. They all carry a specific three-letter code that will be read by the machine. Now we come to the heart of the process. 
Inside the ribosome, the RNA is pulled through like a tape. The code for each amino acid is read off, three letters at a time, and matched to three corresponding letters on the transfer molecule. When the right transfer molecule plugs in, the amino acid it carries is added to the growing protein chain. Again, you are watching this in real time. And after a few seconds, the assembled protein starts to emerge from the ribosome. Ribosomes can make any kind of protein. It just depends what genetic message you feed in on the RNA. In this case, the end product is hemoglobin. The cells in our bone marrow churn out a hundred trillion molecules of it per second. And as a result, our muscles, brain, and all the vital organs in our body receive the oxygen they need. Unless something stops the hemoglobin from working properly. Catrice suffers from a disease called sickle cell anemia that affects her hemoglobin. Hello, Catrice. It sometimes causes her a great deal of pain. What kind of pain are you having? Chest pain. Chest pain? And on a pain scale from zero to 10, what would you say that it was? About a nine. A nine? The pain is worse than breaking a bone or fracturing a bone. It's a real extreme kind of pain. The only thing that comes to mind is somebody stabbing me. When the pain gets really bad, it's called a pain crisis. If it was just a normal pain crisis and they caught it before it turned into anything else, I would be in the hospital from up to three days to a week. But if they didn't catch it in time and it turned into something else such as pneumonia or the flu or something like that, I would be in there for a week up to a month at a time. Have you been coughing a lot? Mm -hmm. Have you had any trouble breathing at all? No. Okay. I was always stopped from doing what other children did. I couldn't play in the snow all the time. I couldn't go swimming on certain days. Um, it really took a toll on me at once because I, I always wanted to do it. And I'm like, well, why me? What, what happened here? The disease gets its name from what happens to Catrice's red blood cells when she experiences an attack. They become sickle-shaped, and these distorted cells get stuck in small blood vessels so that parts of the body don't get the oxygen they need. Fortunately, Catrice is okay much of the time, but she must take care not to overdo it because the extra oxygen demands on her body might cause sickle cells to form. Catrice suffers because just a single code letter is different in her DNA. It causes a change in just one of the amino acids that make up her hemoglobin protein. The wrong amino acid makes her hemoglobin stick together forming long fibers that distort the shape of her red blood cells. Sickle cell anemia is an inherited disease. Catrice's parents each have one copy of the gene for normal hemoglobin and one for the sickle cell kind. They get by fine. But unfortunately, Catrice inherited the faulty copy from both her parents, and so she has the disease. For now, all doctors can do is help relieve the pain. But there is hope. That hope comes from knowledge, detailed knowledge of our DNA. Today, scientists are optimistic that they will find a cure for diseases such as sickle cell anemia, as well as many others.
A milestone has been passed with completion of the Human Genome Project, a huge international collaboration between governments and commercial companies to decode the complete set of human genes. Think of the number of letters that fit on a single page. Now imagine a stack of pages 300 feet tall. That's how much information is stored in the DNA inside every human cell, the entire human genome. Sequencing it was an incredible technical achievement that has been compared with the landing on the moon. I thought that it would probably be the most important scientific discovery in the 20th century. I thought it had the promise of identifying the main variants, which are high predictors of all kinds of cancers and Parkinson's and Alzheimer's and uh, other medical problems. So it seemed to me it was worth a lot of money and a lot of investment. And we put a lot of money into it, about two and a half billion dollars, as I remember. To sequence the entire human genome, it was first broken up into millions of smaller fragments that could be read. One of the scientists who worked out how to piece all the fragments of DNA back together again was Jim Kent. If you could imagine taking 10 copies of War and Peace, putting it through a shredder, mix them all up, and let them sit in the compost heap for about a month or so, so that um, now you've got all these little shreds of these books that um, are partly rotted away. <laughs> And since you've got 10 copies, you know, you, even though it's partly rotted, you, you should be able to string the whole thing together. But it would be a job. And, and in a sense, that was, that was our job. The human genome is so enormous that the only way to handle all the data is to put it into a computer. Clever software can search through the billions of code letters to find the genes. Before, we had to study little pieces of our DNA, individual genes, in isolation, one at a time. Now, finally, we have the total picture. There are some immediate surprises. One is that the total number of human genes is lower than we guessed, just 30 to 40,000. If you sort through the human genome, you find that only 1% of the DNA codes for protein. Vast regions of our DNA seem to do nothing at all. Imagine that you're traveling on the genome, and a lot of it, if, if you looked at it, it would be like, um, sort of trash, so you, you get to plow through some of this mess, and then you'll hit a gene, and sometimes they're just one off the other off the other, and it's just straight five, 10, 15 genes all in a row. Quite why that is, we don't know. And then suddenly, you know, it's all chilled out, and uh, there's nothing going on, there's a sort of big gene, there's just one gene in a region. Just scanning over it, you just see thousands upon thousands of little stories about how your eyes work, or how your bones get put together, or how the liver works. And when this gene has a defect, then this disease happens. And it's just a rich, massive story in some sense. Perhaps the most surprising discovery is just how similar all of life is, confirming the evolutionary truth first recognized by Charles Darwin that all species are descended from a common ancestor. Compare the genome of a human to that of a fruit fly, and they're remarkably similar. 61% of the genes in a fruit fly are also present in our DNA. Compare our genetic sequence with that of a mouse, and the match is even closer. It seems that life has one basic DNA operating system for everything. Bacteria, fruit flies, mice, whales, and people. 
and each species is just a variation on the same basic biological theme. In the 50 years since the double helix was discovered, science has revealed that DNA is the secret at the heart of life. It's very unusual for a static structure, just a molecular structure, to give such insight into even one function, let alone a whole lot of different functions, and such key functions, because they are the key functions of biology. So that's why, it, that we, that's why essentially it's regarded as an important discovery. As the first species to understand the instructions of life, we've reached a critical stage in our evolution. How we use this knowledge carries enormous responsibilities. Imagine a world where future generations are healthier and live longer, where there's food and energy resources for everyone. It's possible. DNA holds the key to the past. It also holds the key to the future.